Friday. I'm Kira Phillips. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Burning the midnight oil and still no deal on that massive bipartisan infrastructure bill. Progressives revolting and key senators refuse to play ball on President Biden's larger investment bill. Lawmakers working around the clock. A compromise with the chamber expected today. And we're following that hearing today that could overturn a controversial Texas abortion law prohibiting abortions after six weeks of pregnancy. That law sparking strong reaction from both sides. The case now before a Texas judge as the Justice Department says the U.S. must ensure Texas cannot insulate itself from judicial review. We'll have more on that coming up. Starting today, snail mail living up to its name. The U.S. Postal Service changing first class mail and periodicals and the delivery times. The post office says it needs to save money delivering by ground rather than by air. To La Palma, Spain, and another crack in the volcano carving a new lava path. About 6,000 people evacu evacuated so far, and more than 800 buildings, including homes and schools, destroyed. But we begin with drug maker Merck saying its new COVID pill can cut the chances of death or being admitted to the hospital in half. This news coming as the U.S. is seeing its first notable decline in the COVID infection rate in more than three months. Whit Johnson has the latest for us. In the fight against COVID, pharmaceutical company Merck releasing new data about their antiviral drug Molnupiravir, which reduced the risk of hospitalization or death by up to 50% in clinical trials. This is the first uh, oral antiviral that will be available to combat uh, COVID-19 and why that's so important. If you think of it, if you're someone who is, who is unfortunate enough to get the news that you've contracted COVID-19, uh, this is a pill you can take at home and it will significantly reduce the risk that you either ultimately are hospitalized or more importantly, that you would ever fa face the unfortunate uh, outcome of death. The company says the results of their phase three trial were so promising, they ended it early in consultation with the FDA. They looked at 775 non-hospitalized adult patients with mild to moderate COVID and at least one risk factor for severe illness. Through 29 days, no deaths were reported in patients who received the drug, compared to eight deaths in patients who got a placebo. The drug also effective against the Delta, Gamma, and Mu variants. Well, what this does, this is an oral antiviral, so it's a pill you take. Uh, you take, it's a, it's a five-day course of, of therapy, and by taking the pill, it actually inserts into the RNA of the virus and stops it from working. And that really is, is the magic of how this works and really allows you to significantly reduce the risk of hospitalization or death. The drug consists of a series of pills taken within five days of testing positive for COVID. Merck is expected to apply for FDA emergency use authorization as soon as possible. This as the battle over vaccine mandates heats up. In New York City, teachers and staff up against a deadline tonight to get their first shots or risk losing their jobs. I'm, I'm not exactly sure what I'm gonna do. I will, I will continue to advocate against these mandates, uh, but obviously I'm, I'm gonna need to figure out how I'm gonna pay my bills and support my son. Northwell Health, the state's largest hospital system, saying nearly 100% of its employees are now fully vaccinated. But late Thursday, a federal appeals court blocked the firing of New York health care workers who claimed a religious exemption, pending the outcome of a court hearing next month. The governor standing firm. It's hard to force people to do something that you truly wish they would do voluntarily. Back to that new antiviral medication. It's considered to be significantly less expensive and less cumbersome than things like monoclonal antibodies, which usually require patients to go inside a hospital or a clinic to receive treatment. Merck says it's planning to have up to 10 million courses of the drug ready to go by the end of the year. Kira. We'll follow developing news with you. Whit Johnson, thanks so much. Now, as we mentioned, in Texas today, there's a hearing that could potentially overturn the state's extremely controversial abortion law. And as that battle continues, a Supreme Court case out of Mississippi is scheduled for this fall and could have far more sweeping impact. 
abortion opponents calling it the best chance in 50 years of overturning Roe versus Wade. Abortion rights advocates warn it could clear the way for every state to write their own abortion bans. Our Devin Dwyer spent 36 hours at the only clinic left in Mississippi for a closer look at the case and what's on the line. A sultry summer weekday in Jackson, Mississippi. Your baby is not a mistake. Your baby's a gift from God. Love your wife. Love your girlfriend, sir. You're not loving her by doing this. Women from across the South arriving just after dawn. Right this way. This is your grandbaby. How can you do this to your grandchild? Exercising a constitutional right to abortion now under existential threat. This is well, the last remaining abortion clinic in the whole state. It is the only one. The and only one. we have been trying yes. so hard, so hard, and have come close a couple of times to getting it shut down. To its defenders, Jackson Women's Health is a beacon of hope, seeing more than 200 patients a month roughly 3,000 a year. A survivor of decades of protests and vandalism, the only abortion clinic left in Mississippi, now waging a legal war to defend a woman's right to choose. Does this moment feel different to oh, you? Yeah, definitely. Kim Gibson is a volunteer escort who helps guide women past protesters at the clinic. She says Mississippi's abortion rights case before the Supreme Court could be the most consequential in decades. This is a real threat. All of these other things are just tiny cuts. And don't, don't get me wrong, death by a thousand cuts is a real thing. But this is a very tangible decision that will, if they make it, overturn Roe v. Wade. This could be the whole country. Correct. This will, this will affect the whole country, absolutely. While Texas abruptly blocked most abortions in that state this month, conservative activists in Mississippi have been laying the legal groundwork for a sweeping new national standard. You like to see Mississippi become the first abortion-free state Absolutely. in the I country. Absolutely. I like to see any state be the first abortion-free state. <laughs> state Attorney General Lynn Fitch, who's leading the effort, and officials from abortion opponents Pro-Life Mississippi and the Center for Pregnancy Choices declined to speak with ABC News about their plans. But in court documents, Mississippi is defending a ban on abortion after 15 weeks of pregnancy before fetal viability and hoping to eradicate 50 years of Supreme Court precedent since Roe versus Wade. I think this is the time. It's six conservatives now. Yes, we're praying that they'll be bold enough and strong enough to take a stance in the right to the right side. Well, the prayers go up. Somebody needs to get a look inside. Dorenda Hancock, co-founder of the Pink House Defenders, helps keep the path clear for as many women as the clinic can handle. If you're coming to okay. the clinic, you can pull right on in, honey. The Defenders provide physical and moral support to women on the journey from the safety of their cars to the clinic door. So are you just going to come out here and pray? Or are you going to come out here and yell at women? Hancock says getting to know demonstrators by name is not just Southern hospitality. You have to know who these people are so you know what their limits are. Because he's on our sidewalk, he intimidates our patients, and I don't think God would want that to happen. So, you know, you can pray to get rid of abortion anywhere. So the Bible says don't stand with the sinners. Go home. Keith Dalton is one of the regulars outside Jackson Women's Health. He's a pastor of a local church, father of five, a self-described former punk rocker. I care about him as a Christian. Um, obviously, I believe in the hard truths of the Bible. I'll rebuke sin, I'll, I'll call it out, but at the same time, I do care because I was once bound in my sin. I was raised Southern Baptist, but it didn't last long. I mean, you talk to Shannon, everyone inside the clinic is Christian. Jackson Women's Health, how may I help you? Our only appointment for tomorrow will be at 8 a.m. Shannon Brewer, a Jackson native and mother of six, has been the clinic's director for over a decade. From her office off the waiting room, she keeps constant watch on the protesters and the clinic's compliance with strict state abortion laws. I guess I don't have an issue with somebody who's against abortion. You know, I don't need her to convince me, so I'm not trying to convince her. Nothing worth having comes easy. I believe that. I truly believe that. And this place has made me believe that even more. On the day we visited, staff were preparing for five scheduled surgical abortions and 30 medication abortions. So we have to know when doctor coming in so we know what size blood to give them. Most women here terminate their pregnancies with a pill. The drug mifepristone administered in the office, then a second drug course of misoprostol is taken at home. So you cannot get an abortion the first visit. They have to schedule their appointment to come back in 24 hours. But the issue is, since our doctors are coming from out of town, 
if the, if that patient comes on our doctor's last day, the patient has to wait a whole week to come back for their second visit. Our job is to make sure that you feel supported in your decision and that you have all the information that you need. In the waiting room, we found relief and anxious anticipation. 20-year-old Aaliyah, who asked not to give her real name, told us she's 14 weeks pregnant. They came in kind of wishy-washy, but I feel like I have been well informed as well as taken care of mentally in the way that they treat patients. 27-year-old Aaron, who also asked not to use her real name, is 10 weeks pregnant and drove two hours for her appointment. I wish there was more places like this, closer, you know, just kind of everywhere. <laughs> In 1996, when the clinic opened, women had access to abortion care at nearly a dozen facilities across Mississippi. But a cascade of onerous state laws gradually forced many of those clinics to close. Jesus! By 2006, Jackson Women's Health was the only clinic left, and in 2013, it was nearly forced to shut down before a federal court blocked a hospital admitting privileges law that would have left the clinic without any doctors. They wanted safe, legal abortions. Now you have safe, legal abortions. Now, guess what? You're going to throw all of that away to turn around and have unsafe, illegal abortions? Now you're going to have women dying, women showing up at the hospital, women hemorrhaging, women infections. That's what you're going to have. A lawyer from Mississippi told us off camera that the state's position is that the Supreme Court got Roe versus Wade egregiously wrong and that there's no fundamental right to abortion in the text of the Constitution. The state tells the justices in court documents that longstanding precedent has damaged the democratic process, poisoned our national discourse, and plagued the law. Mississippi Mississippi also argues that a lot has changed since the 1973 decision. Adoption is accessible and on a wide scale. Women attain both professional success and a rich family life. Contraceptives are more available and effective. And scientific advances show that an unborn child has taken on the human form and features months before viability. The state's attorneys argue states should be able to act on those developments. Do you think about the justices? I mean, and do you think that Ruth Bader Ginsburg's death sort of cleared the way for this? I kind of think about the people that are on there, but I'm not quite sure if these people actually want to be remembered for overturning it. Throughout the pandemic and as the legal battle heats up, the flow of women seeking out abortion at Jackson Women's Health has continued nonstop. And some women of all ages, you know, have to make this, this difficult decision in their life. Nicole, who's eight that. weeks pregnant, told us an abortion is not something she or any woman want to have, but that having the choice is critical. I do have other children, um, but I've also lost a child. And so um, having a child pass away of health issues. You don't want to bring it. You're scared. You don't know if they're going to have that problem. And you don't know if they're going to need medical help and if that's something that, you know, you can take on. And it's just not something that my husband and I are ready for. We're just not ready yet. How great of a job are we doing as a people, as women, as, as you know, pro-choice people? How great of a job are we really doing? If, it's, if we're the only ones that are open. A pivotal moment for a movement and for women on the front lines. Years ago, I had the ability to make the best choice for me, which was to have an abortion. And I think that over the years, people have just gotten, I guess, complacent, expecting that Roe v. Wade and legal abortion will always be available to them. You've seen a lot of these legal battles. This is the breaker. This is the one that says there will still be access to abortion in Mississippi or there won't. For ABC News, I'm Devin Dwyer in Jackson, Mississippi. And our thanks to Devin for that in-depth report. Well, Los Angeles County is righting a wrong a century later, returning a beachfront property to the descendants of the black family who actually owned it. The land was seized by the town with plans of building a park, but the property sat idle for decades until now. Serene Shaw has more. A century-long injustice now corrected. Los Angeles County giving this beachfront property to the Bruce family. Descendants accepting the Manhattan Beach land that Willa and Charles Bruce bought in 1912 for $1,200. Their great-great-grandson, Anthony Bruce, giving thanks. 
and I want to thank everyone who is here today. This less than a quarter acre now worth millions. The Bruces were among the city's first black landowners, creating a resort for many barred from beaches because of segregation. The couple then becoming targets of racist attacks. In 1929, Manhattan Beach took the Bruce's property by eminent domain, citing the urgent need for a public park. But for decades, it sat empty. Black Lives Matter protests quickly catching the attention of lawmakers. Is this enough? Uh, no, this is only the first step in our fight for justice for Charles and Willa Bruce and their descendants. Uh, the first demand we had was to restore the land to the family. There's also the restitution of the loss of revenue for the past 97 years. The governor signing into law the land's return. Thanks again to our Zorin Shah there in Manhattan Beach, California. Well, coming up, it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And when we come back, why this pandemic has made screenings even more critical. And welcome back. Well, today is October 1st, which means it's the start of Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And today we have to talk about this pandemic and how it's made screenings more critical now than ever. According to the CDC, we are seeing an 87% decline in breast cancer screenings. And there's a real concern now that it will result in a tidal wave of stage three and stage four breast cancer cases. I'd like to bring in its founder of the Susan G. Komen Organization and co-founder of of the Promise Fund, Nancy Brinker. Nancy, thanks so much for being here with us. Thank you, Kira. It's wonderful to be here with you today, and thanks for covering this topic. Of course, and we always do. It's important to us, and obviously we've had a lot of women impacted, uh, even here at ABC, by breast cancer. So we love to talk about it and promote the importance of getting mammograms. And, you know, we've talked about these cancer cases, Nancy, and how they've gone undetected during this pandemic as people have skipped their appointments, not been able to get out of the house, and it's been making mammogram screenings you know, even more urgent. Let's just remind folks uh, how important these are to detect cancer and how we need to make up for the lost time. Well, breast and cervical cancers are two, Kira, uh, of the largest cancer killers of women. 80 to 90 percent that's how far behind we are in women, uh, the drop in women getting screenings for breast cancer last year in 2020. And I'm very afraid of the dire outcomes and, and they'll come quickly because people who miss screenings and have early disease, it can easily uh, go into very uh, advanced disease. Uh, particularly we notice this in, in populations with disparities, which is what the Promise Fund of Florida deals with. We have 85,000 women in the center of our state in Palm Beach County who have no medical home, no insurance, no Medicaid, no way to access or afford breast cancer care. So we created a screening center, subsidized screening center. And uh, so far we've screened, treated, navigated and taken care of over 10,000 of them. And we have to be able to keep this up. We're very worried though about people not coming in for their screenings and getting taken care of. And, you know, 2021 marks 50 years since President Nixon declared a war on cancer. I mean, I, I right. remember the, the, that phrase and, and that mission. Where does the right. U.S. stand in this so-called war now? I mean, a lot has happened with regard to therapies and treatment. Well, you know, a tremendous amount of research has been done in this country. The, my, the organization I founded in 1981, honoring my sister, has given uh, literally billions of dollars to research and uh, applied care in communities. But this is where we're missing all of us and why we created the Promise Fund. It is the disparities patients have, and they suffer the most because they have no access to care, no affordability, and we have to build systems. And that's what we're doing in Palm Beach County is creating systemic change in our healthcare system. So we can give render care to people in the earliest stages when we believe breast and cervical cancer are curable. And it's really, really important. In fact, today we've started our Pink Boots campaign, where we're asking every woman who wants to join us at the Promise Fund to get a pair of pink brain boots, and we're wearing them all over, and we're going to wear them every day until uh, we've made a big dent in this problem, and we're moving very quickly. 
You know, just for a moment, just to personalize, uh, we're talking about a, a lot of uh, developments and stats and the, the where we stand right now. But just for a second, uh, Nancy, because it's been such a long time, taking it back to your sister, when you started this organization, just, I just think about you know, how she's looking down on you thinking, wow, you have created an unbelievable organization, moved on to another organization. I mean, do you, my guess is you just feel her spirit with you uh, on a regular basis. Uh, she was an extremely important person in my life. And when you look, when someone looks at you, who you love very much and asks you to do the one thing, cure the disease. And the next part of it was take care of those people who are very under-resourced because she said, even as she was dying and we were sitting in a cancer clinic one day, she said to me, you know, where a woman lives shouldn't matter whether she lives. And that's our mantra. And we get up every day, uh, Karen, we put our pink boots on and we keep going. And we want to see this campaign and our style of the systemic change go to every community in America. Uh, it can be replicated at really a very low cost. It takes a lot of human will, commitment, gathering what resources are available in a community to help people be screened, navigated, treated, and uh, hopefully overcome this disease at an early stage. Nancy Brinker, thanks for helping save so many lives for so many decades. Appreciate you. Thank you for having me today. Well, coming up, we are celebrating 50 years of Walt Disney World. When we come back, our Ginger C, of course, takes her son behind the scenes. Wouldn't we all? They had quite a good time. You'll get an inside look at all the new magic straight ahead. And welcome back. So glad you're streaming with us here on ABC News Live. Can you believe Walt Disney World is celebrating 50 magical years with all kinds of new rides and restaurants and unforgettable new celebrations? So, of course, our Ginger Z decided to take her kids and head to Disney World. And now we get a behind the scenes look at everything. It's Walt Disney World's most magical celebration. A new dazzling iridescent glow on icons transforming at night into beacons of magic. Take a selfie with these new golden sculptures popping up in all four parks. The all new Kite Tales, taking some of our favorite characters to new heights. I've got Adrian and Miles, my boys with me. You ready? Yeah! <laughs> First stop, Epcot at the reimagined France Pavilion, inspired by the flavorful world of the movie favorite, Ratatouille. Taste check, spoon down. One, two, three. <laughs> let's go see what Chef Remy's got cooked up. Come on, let's go, let's go. Woohoo! Wait for me. We're off to Remy's Ratatouille adventure. Ratatouille! It's time to eat a local favorite at the new restaurant La Creperie de Paris. It's so important to bring them a little taste mm. of France and culture. Bon appétit. Behind this door is one of the most highly anticipated attractions, Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind. Cameras haven't been in here until now. Ready? Let's do this. Something extra special about this specific uh, attraction starts backward. It does. This is Disney's first reverse launch coaster. And then another piece of it is, is that we can now rotate you to any direction. Want to really meet the excitement and the energy and the scale of these Guardian of the Galaxy movies and hopefully doing that here too for all of our guests. That was awesome! Powerhouse, Christina Aguilera kicking off the 50th festivities. The Disney magic comes to life with two never before seen nighttime extravaganzas. Harmonious, Epcot's largest nighttime spectacular ever. 
the breathtaking show featuring Disney songs in more than a dozen languages from 240 artists all over the world. Remember me. Including a favorite from the movie Coco, sung by the five-time Grammy-nominated Louis Fonsi. This is Remember Me Reimagined. I got to sing it with a, with a dear friend, Joy, who is an amazing artist from Mexico. And to be a part of something that's going to be here for, hopefully, for a very long time, it's one for the record books for me. And the all-new Disney enchantment illuminating over the Magic Kingdom. We could not have had a better time. The boys loved every moment of it, and I did too. It's so great to be able to see it through their eyes and to realize that the stories for 50 years, half a century, really make this worth celebrating. And much like many of us, not just one day for a birthday or anniversary, not just a week, but an 18-month celebration full of so many things, including that ride that they just announced, the one I showed you, Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind, opening in 2022. Very exciting stuff stuff here, Kira. And thank you, Ginger, so much for that. Behind the scenes, your boys were adorable. And you can watch the most magical story on Earth, 50 years of Walt Disney World tonight, 8 p.m. Eastern, right here on ABC. And that does it for this hour. I'm Kira Phillips. Thanks so much for joining us. Remember, ABC News Live is here for you all day with the latest news, context, and analysis. I'll see you back here, 3 p.m. Eastern, with Terry Moran. Have a beautiful Friday. We do a disservice to society as a whole if we are not providing the same kinds of encouragement to women to contribute as we do to men. So to me, it's all about understanding, you know, that inherently women and men are of equal worth, have equal amounts to contribute, and we absolutely need to make sure that we are getting those contributions from women. We have ignition. We have liftoff of Discovery on the second mission to Planet Earth research flight. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.